الحمد ثم الحمد ثم الحمد لك حمدا كثيرا طيبا يا رب لك أعطيتنا خيرا كثيرا ربنا سترت عن كل الورى عيوبنا ثم الصلاة بعد والتسليم على النبي المصطفى الكريم وآله وصحبه الكرام السادة الأبرار والعظام وبعد فاعلموا فخير ما طرى به لسان ناطق وما جرى بنان كاتب به التوحيد الحمد لله تعينه واستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور ينفسنا من يهدي الله فلا مدل له ومن يدل فلا هادي له والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين ولا إخوان النبيين والمرسلين رضي الله عنه محات المؤمنين ولبيت الطاهرين ولا الخلفاء الراشدين أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وللأئمة المهتدين أبي حنيفة ومالك والشافي وأحمد so inshallah in this lesson we are starting the hadith of Inna Ma'lu and Bin Niyad, the first hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari uh, and we mentioned in the last lesson just at the ending of the last lesson about the importance of this hadith we mentioned that Imam Shafi rahimahullah he said that this hadith covers one third of knowledge one third of knowledge and it is mentioned by Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal he says the foundations of Islam are based upon three hadiths. It's based upon three hadiths. And he says that the first hadith is this hadith. It is one of the foundations of the deen. He says the hadith of Inna Malu bin Niyad that the very the actions are based but on the intentions. And the second one which he says it's uh, uh, one third of Islam is the hadith of uh, Aisha radiyallahu anha man ahdasa fi amrina haza ma laysa minhu fawarad that anyone who introduces any matter uh, in the affair into our affair yani ki the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is not part of it will be rejected the hadith of bid'ah anyone who innovates anything into the religion it will not be accepted and the third hadith is the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir yani ki the halal bayin wa haram bayin that the halal is clear and the haram is clear that hadith we are going to do later on so this is according to Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah he says that these three are the foundations of Islam however according to Ishaq ibn Rahwi Ishaq ibn Rahwi the great muhaddis the great scholar he mentions that the foundations of the religion are on four hadiths. Four main hadiths are the foundations of the whole of the deen. And even him, he also mentions that the first one he brings is the hadith of Inna Mala Alu bin Niyad. And okay, the actions are by the intention, the hadith that we are going to study now. So that is, this is how important it is. The second hadith he mentions, which is the foundation of Islam, is uh, the halal ubayin wa haram ubayin. Yani ki the halal is clear and the haram is also clear and what is in between them are the matters of doubt. So we will be looking into that hadith later on when that comes. The third one which he mentions is, is the hadith of uh, indeed the creation of one of you comes together in the stomach of his mother for 40 days. Okay, so this is the third hadith he mentions. And the fourth hadith which he says is the same one which Imam, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahimahullah has said. It is the hadith of Man ahdasa fi amrina haza ma laysa minhu fawrad. That anyone who innovates in, into our religion, that is not part of it, will be rejected. So these are the four main hadiths which have been mentioned according to him. And it is also further on mentioned uh, the, uh, what Imam uh, Abu Dawood rahimahullah who has the fourth most authentic book. Uh, he mentions, uh, subhanAllah, that I uh, memorized over 40,000 hadiths. More memorized over 40,000 hadiths. Then I looked into them 40,000 hadiths and I broke it down from 40,000 to 200,000. And he said that I look, I, I picked out these 200,000 as to those hadiths which cover the whole of the religion. And then from them 200,000, he says that I broke it further down from them and I uh, came down to four main hadiths. Four main hadiths which covers the whole of the religion. And these need to be studied 
these need to be studied in detail it is only then they will understand uh, the the meaning of these hadiths so the first hadith which he mentioned is the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir that the halal is clear and the haram is clear and the hadith that we are going to do now the second one is in the Mal'amalu bin Niyad and the third hadith is the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu who said that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and does not accept anything that which is un- unless it is pure and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Muslims with that which he ordered the prophets and the fourth hadith is the hadith which is in regards to uh, from the excellence the beauty of Islam is by the leaving of those things which do not benefit him so these are uh, those hadiths which Imam Abu Dawood rahimahullah came down to these four hadiths okay we'll start the hadith of in the Malamalu bin Niyat we'll start with the chain first as you know the chain is probably the most important part of the hadith so there's two parts of the hadith one is the actual text the matan uh, and one is the sanad the sanad the chain of how this uh, hadith has reached imam bukhari rahimahullah and so this is the part which is probably the most important so it always the hadith always starts with haddasana Haddasana, what does this mean? Haddasana, this is when the teacher is reading the hadith to the student. It says, Haddasana Humaydiyu Abdullah ibn Zubayr. Qala Haddasana Sufyan, Qala Haddasana Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari, Qala Akhbarni Muhammad ibn Ibrahim al Taymi, Annahu Samiya al Kama ibn Waqas al Laysi, Yakulu Samitu Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu ala mimbar. Okay, before we go any more further on to the text, let me explain who these individuals are in the Sanad. So when it says, حَدَّثَنَا حُمَيْدِيُ Abdullah ibn Zubayr, then he is the teacher of Imam Bukhari. al Humaydi, he was from the Quraysh. And if you remember, we mentioned in the last lesson, one of the reason, this, uh, reasons why Imam Bukhari rahimullah, is using this chain is because he's a Qurayshi. He is from the tribe of Quraysh. His name is Abdullah ibn Zubair al Humaydi. Okay, so Imam Bukhari rahimullah is decided to use this chain, even though Imam Bukhari rahimullah did have other chains as well of in the Malu bin Yad, but he has used this particular chain. Uh, and now he says, Haddasana uh, Sufyan. Who, which Sufyan is this? This is Sufyan ibn Uayna. Okay, Sufyan ibn Uayna. He says, Qala Haddasana Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari. Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari uh, ibn Qais al Ansari. This is a well known name. He is a Sikha Rawi. Yani he is a well known good Rawi who has uh, been uh, mentioned about his goodness and how uh, clever he was and how much of a, uh, a, a good hearted, a taqwa person he was. So he's known as a Sikha Rawi. All the Muhaddisin have accepted him. Uh, Imam Malik rahimahullah has accepted him, he is narrated from him, Shu'ba, Yahya al-Qattan, is all mentioned from him. He has narrated about 300 hadiths and he died in the year 143 Hijri. Uh, Yahya is the one who made this hadith mashhur. Okay? Uh, now in this chain, when this hadith first came, now the Prophet وسلم, he told this to Umar bin Khattab. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu and now the Umar bin Khattab, as we're going to be doing the hadith, it mentioned Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was on the member and he narrated this. Now, the one who's narrating this is al qama ibn Waqas and then it, it was Muhammad ibn, ibn Ibrahim and then it went to Yahya ibn Sa'id. This is all one chain. Okay, there's only one people narrating this. It was after Yahya ibn Sa'id where this hadith really became mashur. After that, many people learned about this. Okay, so I w- uh, I w- if you can see this, uh, I'm passing out this handout where this shows you the chain uh, and you can have a rough idea of how uh, this sanad works because this is known as a gharib narration. Gharib narration means that in any particular time, uh, at a particular era, where there was one Rawi, one narrator narrating that hadith, only one, any time. It can be in the time of the Sahaba, it can be in the time of the Tabi'een or the Tabatabi'een. If there's one narrator narrating it, 
it becomes a gharib okay uh, and if there's two people narrating it it becomes aziz and if there's three people narrating it it becomes mashhur but this is uh, uh, this is gharib because there's only one person narrating it till it came to yahya ibn said okay so he narrates it uh, uh, and then he says akhbarni muhammad ibn ibrahim at taymi now who was muhammad ibn ibrahim at taymi his full name was muhammad ibn ibrahim ibn haris al qurayshi okay and he was a well known siqarawi accepted narrator in all the books of Sahih Sitta, in the books of Sahih Sitta, he is a very well accepted Rawi, uh, a good Rawi, which has been accepted by all the Muhaddisin. And he died in the 120 Hijri. Okay, he died in the 120 Hijri. He says, uh, that he had heard from Alqama ibn Waqas al Laisi saying that I heard from Umar bin Khattab anhu, whilst he was on the member saying I heard from Rasulullah saying Inna mala'malu bin niyat Inna mala'malu bin niyat Indeed actions are by intentions and for every person is what he intended Okay so this first part of the hadith we're going to study this first. What does this actually mean? Uh, so, there's two translations which you can really do of Inna Malamalu bin Niyat. So, one intention is that uh, that the actions are dependent on the Niyat. They are dependent on the Niyat. So, whatever the Niyat is, that is what your Jaza, that will be your, uh, your reward in terms of your action. The question is now, what is Niyat? What is Niyah? Niyah is the derived from the word uh, Nawa Yanwi, which is from the Daraba Yadribu, the, those who know Arabic, it is derived from that word. It means Irada. It means an Irada, an intention in the heart. Uh, and this is the first stage uh, before any person decides to do anything. And Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, he explains uh, about the details of the connection or between the intention and between an action. So he says that before any human does any action, uh, then what happens is he has to have an intention. For example, uh, I intend to pick up a pen. I intend to pick up this pen. Uh, when I intend this, the signals go to the brain which orders the relevant body parts to move so the action can be achieved. So the action can be achieved. So this proves that the actions are dependent, they are mawkuf, on the irada, on the intentions. And irada, the intention, is something which is based on the purpose, the ghard. It is known as the ghard. The ghard means uh, some kind of a purpose that you want to achieve. So if you don't have a purpose behind it, then you're not going to make the intention. And if you're not going to make the intention, then the action will not carry out. So the foundation of it all, it goes down to the ghard. Now with the ghard, when you have a purpose, what goes even more further down to this is the knowledge. So if you have the knowledge of uh, that I can make a phone call with this mobile phone. So you know this, this is part of your knowledge. So now you want to make a call, this is now you've got a purpose, you've got a ghard. Okay, when you've got a ghard, now you will make the intention. When you make this intention, then the signals will then go to the brain and then it will order the relevant body part to do the action. So the hand will pick up the phone and this is all... Uh, uh, a process of how the action is carried out okay so this is how it, it is related to the need the intention of the person the actual definition of the word need the niya uh, it is an action of the heart an action of the heart a niya to fi'lul qalb okay it is not an action of the tongue okay you do not say the niyat. It is something which is in the heart. 
And this is what Alama uh, Haskafi rahimahullah mentioned in his Dur al Mukhtar. Uh, and uh, many of the ulama they have mentioned about this as well. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah he also mentions about uh, the reality of Niya that it is something which is in the heart, it is not an action of the tongue. So when you are reading your salah, you do not say the niyat. You do not say the niyat, I am praying for rakat, uh, zuhur salah, uh, I'm facing the Kaaba. This is uh, uh, not of the tongue. So it, the niyat is something of the heart. Okay, why did you even uh, get ready for salah? Why did you even stand up? Because you had the intention. Why did you go to the masjid? Because you had the intention. So that's the action of the heart. It is not the action of the tongue. Lama Haskafi rahimahullah, he also mentions, فَلَا إِبْرَةَ لِلذَّكْرِ بِاللِّسَانِ إِنْ خَالِفُ الْقَلْبِ لِأَنَّهُ قَلَامٌ لَا نِيَةً He says that no preference will be given to the tongue if what is in the heart is different. Because the kalam uh, is not the niyyah. The kalam, what you say, it is not niyyah. So for example, if you read your asr salah and you said when you uh, were starting the salah, you read in the, that's the niyyah, you read it on the tongue and you said that I am going to pray the maghrib salah. You're supposed to say asr salah. Okay, but you said I'm going to pray my maghrib salah. So, the preference will be given to what was in the heart, not what is on the tongue. This is uh, in regards to uh, giving the preference because the reality is that the niyat is something which is uh, in the heart. Now, those who do say it on the tongue, the ulama have said it is makru. So many scholars have said it is makru. Some scholars have said it is bid'ah. So it is bid'ah to say it on the tongue. The reason is because there is no hadith from the Prophet ﷺ or the Sahaba that they ever uttered uh, the intention. Because the intention is something within the heart. You don't need to utter this. So uh, many scholars, they say this is bid'ah to, uh, to say the niyat on the tongue. However, the other group of scholars, they say it is makru, it is disliked. Uh, and Alama Haskafi, rahimahullah, he mentions some exceptions as well when a person is allowed to say it on the tongue. Um, one of the exceptions that he gives is when a person is completely baffled, when he's, uh, he's got a calamity which has befallen on him. For example, maybe his parents died, maybe he's in a place where he cannot really think straight. So at that time, just to clarify your intention, a person can utter the words of his niyat, um, and also another exception which is also mentioned by Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he says that when the children are learning, they are early stages and they are just learning of how to make the niyat, what should the niyat be. So at that time, they should be taught um, about uh, the, uttering the niyat. But after that, they should be told that leave this adat, leave this habit after a while. Okay, so this is in regards to uh, what the reality is of niyat. Now this hadith of niyat is split into two parts. The first is the niyat uh, and the second is the reward, the jaza. So based on this first part of the hadith, um, that the actions are rewarded based on the intentions, in the four fuqaha, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik rahimahullah, and Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. All four of the Imams have derived out an usul, a principle. Okay, a principle which uh, is mastered from this hadith. And it this can be used in old times. And this is what it, this is why it is important to study usul because this is gives us the highlight and the importance. Uh, from one hadith which can be used through in all parts of life in any time it can be used whether you are sleeping or at night time or whether it is uh, in uh, work life or whether it is uh, normal life so this usul uh, the first one of this hadith of that the actions are rewarded based on the intentions they have derived out five main usul Five main principles uh, 
uh, which they have all agreed on, not only from this hadith, but from different hadiths, they have derived out five main principles. One is known as uh, al yaqeen la yazuru bi shak, uh, that certainty is not overruled by doubt, and that is supported by the hadith which we mentioned earlier on. Uh, that the halal is clear and the haram is clear and what is in between that are matters of doubt. The, so based on this there is usul which we will come to do later on when we come on to that hadith. Another usul which the four a'imma have derived out uh, from uh, all the hadith is al-mushakkatu tajlabu taysir. Basically means that the, the hardship is pulled away by the easiness. Okay, so for example, uh, at the time of traveling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us uh, an ease to half the prayer. Similarly, doing masa on the hufain and when we are fasting and then we are traveling, we don't need to fast as well. So all these rules in regards to uh, pulling away the hardship. Uh, so there are many usuls based on this. The third usul is al-dararu yuzal, meaning uh, the harm must be removed. And this is based uh, on the hadith uh, of Ubada ibn Samit radiyallahu anhu. He said the Prophet sallallahu said, La darara wa la darar. That do not, harm, uh, do not cause harm or return harm. Okay, so based on this hadith, uh, this usul is made. And there are many examples of this. For example, uh, after doing the tawaf. After doing tawaf, we need to read the two rakat uh, of Nafal at maqam Ibrahim. Now, if there's many people around the Mac of the around the Kaaba, and it's going to cause harm to the people, and it's going to cause harm to yourself, you will not. You don't have to read there. You will read. You can read anywhere where it is safe for you. But now, some people who read it there, they are causing harm to themselves, and they are causing harm to other people. So this is uh, based on this. Similarly, there are many usul which the scholars have derived uh, from this. From even in this time and age, they always use this usul. And the fourth is Al Adatu Muhakkama. Al Adatu Muhakkama Yaniki, the custom is given uh, preference. As long as this custom is not against the Sharia, uh, it is not against any of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ or any of the rulings, then it will be given custom. There's no harm in, fo in following. Uh, a cultural something cult cultural as long as uh, it is uh, in according to the sharia and the fifth usul is this usul of this particular hadith al umuru bi maqasidiha umuru bil maqasidiha that act actions are judged by the intentions behind them and this usul uh, is the usul that we want to be really looking at and study it because of this hadith uh, so the this usul has really been brought into existence to really uh, distinguish something which is a habit and something which is a worship. Now, for example, there are two people who come into the masjid and both of them, they are praying two rakat. They are praying two rakat of nafal. Uh, but one of them is getting three times more sawab than the other one. He's getting three more times to up. They are doing the exact same action. They are doing the exact same action, but one of them is getting three times more so up. Why is that? Because one of them intend he intended that I am praying to rakat nafal for coming to the masjid, but the other one uh, intended his intention was to pray to rakat for coming to the masjid. Two rakat for Salatul Istighfar, to do Istighfar, and also two rakat for doing Wuzu. So he's, he's tripled his intention. So the because the, he tripled his intention, the more he will get rewarded for it. So the more you have uh, intention for a particular action, the more you will be rewarded for it. Another example of this is a person who goes to sleep. Now this is something which you don't get rewarded for. You don't get rewarded for going to sleep. But if you made the intention that I'm going to go to sleep so I can get fresh and I will get up for Fajr Salah and I'll get for Tahajjud Salah and then I can do uh, more worship of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. 
that this will now be a form of reward you going to sleep every breath that you take you will be rewarded for it what's the difference is that you made the intention for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereas normally going to sleep you don't get rewarded for it similarly another one is eating now you eating you don't get rewarded for eating okay you don't get any reward for eating but now if you made the intention that i am eating so i can get my energy back and i can do ibadat of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i can worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i can look after my family i can uh, fulfill the responsibilities which i need to you will be getting rewarded for this for just by making the intention even by uh, eating you will be rewarded for it but in reality if you don't make the intention you don't get any reward for it okay but if you just make the intention so this is goes to show the difference between the earth and the skies is the intention this is how important it is to make the intention and how you, a person can come on the day of judgment and he will have mountains and mountains of good and he will be surprised that how how come i'm rewarded with so th- so much things so much reward i have got and this was all down to his intentions whereas the other person who did the exact same thing but he did not get anywhere near as much reward as the person so and another thing uh, about this usul is to distinguish uh, for example someone uh, doing wuzu now someone who is doing wuzu and someone who's just uh, washing his uh, face he's just washing his feet so what is the difference is the niyat you have to make the niyat for the wuzu uh, otherwise you won't have the wuzu if you didn't make niyat for it if you were just washing your face and you just happened to wash your feet and you didn't even intend you didn't even have the intention to do it then your wuzu is not done you must have the intention to do it similarly is with the ghusl now with the ghusl you need to uh, it if you have the intention of having ghusl then you will be rewarded for this as well so this is a a, a very important thing to uh, really uh, memorize about and to to know about the uh, niyat and in another example of this is when you do itikaf you can sit in the masjid now but you won't be rewarded for itikaf but when you make the intention of itikaf then even if you don't sit for many hours or even if you don't sit for uh, long but you will still be rewarded for itikaf so every single second that you are sat in the masjid you will be getting reward for itikaf as well the example is something that you wear for example wearing uh, three quarters now three quarters uh when when having the izar up to the three quarters halfway through the shin this is something from the sunnah but now if a person who is doing it for fashion he will not be rewarded for it but if one person did it because it is the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to have the izar halfway through the shins then he will be rewarded for it and if you you look at it the action is of the same two people who have got three quarters on but one has got the intention because it is the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the other person has got the intention because it is fashion it's a designer where every everyone like wears this nowadays so uh, this is he will not be rewarded for this but the person who had the intention he will be rewarded for it okay going on to uh, the second part of the hadith the actions the fi'l uh, imam al-ghazali rahimahullah he describes what is a fi'l he says that the action a fi'l is the following of a body a body uh, organ to what the heart has ordered what the heart has ordered meaning the cause of any action is linked to the heart and the intellect okay so the heart uh, is the one that orders and the intellect is the one which gives it the orders as well so when a person wants to carry out any kind of action the first thing is the we mentioned is the knowledge of it so he has the knowledge of something for example the phone or uh, or, or or any or a pen he knows that by a pen i can write with it and he knows that uh, by using a phone i can make a phone call so he has this knowledge and then we mentioned in regards to ghard the purpose so when he sees that now i need to make the pur- i've got a purpose for this so he will uh, then make this intention when the intention comes then that will give to the signal to the brain and then that will 
allow the organs to carry out the action. So Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, he uh, explains it like that and he, break, he brings it down to the heart. He says that the heart is like the king which orders the relevant uh, body parts, the organs to do the actions. Because the other organs, they do not have uh, the power to make a decision. It's what's in the heart and what's in the mind. The mind, he describes it as a governor, which is uh, almost uh, on the level of a king, but he's, he's following what the king orders. So the real thing is the heart, uh, our Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, and the ulama, they also explain it like this as well, that the real thing is the heart, the mind is like the governor. So when the heart wants to do something, it orders and the, the mind, it gives it a, a, a reaction in terms of knowledge. When, for, let's say, for example, a person wants to do something bad. He wants to do something evil. He doesn't want to pray his salah. And he knows by knowledge that he needs to pray his salah. It's something which is fuzz upon him. So the, like the governor, his job is always to advise the king, okay? That's the job of the governor. So similarly, the mind, it advises the heart that uh, you should pray the salah, you cannot miss it. And then the uh, ultimate decision is of the heart, it makes the decision of what it wants to do. And then the body organs, the hands, the feet, the eyes, uh, and the hands, they are only followers. They will only follow what has been ordered to them. So the foundation of all of this is the heart. And inshallah, later on, those hadiths are coming where we will look into these, uh, um, the matters of the heart into a lot more detail. Okay, so this is in regards to the action. Now, in regards to the action, the reality of amal, the outer actions of the, of the human being, uh, is based on four possibilities. It's based on four possibilities uh, in, uh, and that's in relation to the intention. The first possibility is uh, the action is according to the sunnah and the niyat is also according to the sunnah. Okay, so this is in relation to those worships that we want to be rewarded for. That's why we read salah, that's why we fast, that's why we do good things. We want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our worship. Okay, and this is all dependent on this. It's all dependent on this. Uh, and these are the four possibilities. The action is according to the sunnah and the niyat is also sahih. And again, you're doing the niyat for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you have the niyat for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is known as ikhlas. It is known as sincerity, ikhlas. So you're doing it only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot be that you've got your niyat for someone else. You want to read salah, but you're doing it for someone else. You want to show someone else. Okay, you want to show your dad. You want to show uh, your, your husband or you, someone, the husband wants to show someone else that, look, I'm reading salah. I'm So he's trying to show off to a teacher or maybe... This will not be accepted. His all namaz will be batil. It will not be accepted. So the the niyat needs to be sahih, and it uh, the uh, I mean the it needs to be according to the sunnah. The second possibility is the action is wrong, but the niyat is sahih. He's got a good intention, a good intention, uh, but the action that he is doing is wrong. Okay, it's wrong. It's not according to the sunnah uh, and it's not uh, something which has been done by the Prophet ﷺ or the Sahabas or it has not been advised by the Sharia. Okay? And the third possibility is the action is according to the sunnah but the niyat is wrong. So the niyat is wrong but the action is according to the sunnah. The fourth is the action is wrong. The action is wrong. And the niyat is also fasid. It's not even right. Okay, so the, the fourth one is where the niyat is wrong and the action is wrong. So out of these four possibilities, only one of them is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our worships. For our worships to be accepted, uh, it needs to be only one of them. And that was the first one. 
the action is according to the sunnah and the niyat is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is uh, it is had is ikhlas for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you are only doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only this will be accepted for our worships the rest the second the third and the fourth will not be accepted and we see this sometimes people want to do the right thing they've got the right intention but it's not according to the sunnah okay so this will not be accepted and inshallah this will be explained in the hadith of bid'ah when we go on to explaining that furthermore okay um, so these are the four main possibilities uh, of uh, the the actions and only one of them is accepted now let's go on to about the shani wurud what is shani wurud shani wurud is the background of this hadith the background of this hadith is that one of the sahabis who wanted to marry a woman uh, she was named as um Qais, but she refused uh, to marry him until he migrated to medina for her then only she will marry him therefore what happened was that he migrated with the muslims but he did it to marry her he did it to marry her so ibn masood radiallahu anhu he also mentions that after that time he was known as the muhajir of um Qais. so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he then mentioned this hadith of inna mala malu bin niyat that you will be uh, rewarded according to your intentions. And for every man is what he has intended. And whoever did his hijrah towards the dunya will reach, will reach it. That's what he, he will get. Or towards a woman to get married to her. فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَجْرَ إِلَيْهِ Then his hijrat is toward what he has done hijrat to. Uh, to. Okay, so uh, this is the background of this hadith that this uh, the Sahabi who has done hijrat, he did, uh, he migrated uh, to uh, for this woman. He didn't do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned this that he will be rewarded according to his intention. But uh, however, uh, Ibn Hajr Asqalani uh, and Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, they both have said that this is not the Shani Wurud. This was not what was behind this. This was a separate event. However, Mullah Ali Qari rahimahullah, and uh, Alama Iraqi, they have said that this was uh, in relation to this particular hadith. Okay, and inshallah in the next lesson, we'll carry on from this hadith uh, and we'll uh, mention some of the fiqh in regard to the actions as well. Uh, so we leave it till there inshallah. If anyone has got any particular questions about this hadith, then they are free to ask so now. الحمد لله سابغ النعم وخالق الإنسان من بعد العدم فالحمد ثم الحمد ثم الحمد لك حمدا كثيرا طيبا يا رب لك أعطيتنا خيرا كثيرا رب